Uh, welcome to the November 2020 SNOC webinar on hard seated legumes in rotations. Versatility, flexibility and performance in good and bad years by Belinda Hackney. And brought to you by the New South Wales DPI Soils Unit. Now I'd like to introduce Belinda who's presenting today's webinar on hard seated legumes in rotations. Belinda has um, 20 years experience in pasture research and extension. She's worked as an agronomist with New South Wales DPI at the Graham Centre at CSU and Local Land Services. Currently, she's a researcher with the New South Wales DPI Soil and Water Unit. For the past 15 years, she has focused heavily on pasture legume agronomy. In conjunction with Murdoch University and DAFWA colleagues, Belinda developed crop pasture rotation strategies incorporating hard seeded legumes. The field trials from this work have provided some encouraging results and led to the identification of new legume species and varieties for use in New South Wales. As many of you will be aware, Belinda has been doing this for quite a, uh, quite a bit of work recently on legumes with some amazing results. And this month, this month she'll outline how to get started with hard seeded legumes, matching the legumes to the soil and climate, hard seed formation and breakdown, know how to use that to your advantage, summer sowing, get your pasture sowing sorted before the winter cropping program, and the value of hard seeded legumes to crop and pasture systems. And I've recently had the pleasure of being out in the field with Belinda and meet, meeting some of her fantastic growers and seeing those, some of these amazing results. Where I took this photo, which she's kindly allowed me to show today. And it's an absolute pleasure to have Belinda talk about this really exciting topic. All right. Okay. So, look, thank you everyone for the, um, the opportunity to um, talk about what's been going on in this space um, in the last few years. Um, so we'll get stuck into it straight away. So in terms of hard seeded legumes, I suppose the first question is like, why? Why are we even looking at them? And I guess this really came out of um, traditional annual legumes have served us really well and in a lot of cases continue to serve us very well. But um, particularly when you get into less reliable years and unreliable climate and um, changing seasons and that kind of thing, their reliability and persistence um, can be less than optimal in some cases. The other thing that, that came about too is um, harvesting of these legumes, um, is the, the traditional annual legumes is quite a laborious task, it relies particularly for subclover on suction harvesting. Medics are mostly harvested in that way too, although you can get them with a header, um, pick up the uh, pick up the um, the pods with a header and that kind of thing, but it's it's a slow and quite laborious task. So, development of these hard seeded legumes that started or, or has been ongoing for thirty or more years now, um, really focused on looking at what kind of alternatives were out there. And one of the big things that was looked for was are these things able to be harvested with conventional machinery, so with a header and that kind of thing. So that led to the development of these aerial seeding legumes um, that are harvestable on farm using a header, which gives you a cheaper source of seed. There's also the option then to use those in their unprocessed form, which gives you options then to look at some of the innovative establishment techniques that we'll look at today and we'll focus a lot on summer sowing today. Um, and summer sowing has really opened up that window in terms of getting a lot more production out of a first year pasture than what you would get with a conventional pasture where it's sown later in the season. Also, once you've got these hard seeded legumes established and you've got a seed bank of them, then you start to open the door to having more flexible rotations. So you can crop over them and have them um, come back and regenerate strongly without the need for re-sowing. And there's also better soil outcomes. So because you can sow them earlier, um, you achieve ground cover earlier in the season, um, how much a, a legume fixes in terms of nitrogen provided that they're effectively nodulated um, is just a function of how much they grow. So you can potentially fix a lot more nitrogen. And there's also the seed harvest angle, so much less damage into the soil. So in terms of what legumes are we looking at, we're talking about Bicerula, um, Cerradellas, both French and yellow Cerradellas, um, Arrowleaf, Bland and Gladder Clove, um, and, bladder clovers, um, and the thing to remember with these is it's not a one size fits all. So different ones of these or different species and cultivars of these legumes work differently um, depending on the soil and the climate and those sorts of things that you experience on your particular farm. So like choosing any kind of 
um, in your cropping programs and that sort of thing. You choose a thing that's going to work well in your environment and for the kind of uses that you want to um, have that legume for. Now, in terms of how you get started with them, we'll cover that as we go through the talk and then more specifically towards the end of the talk as well. So starting off with um, looking at the soil and climate requirements. So all of these legumes that we're talking about generally have quite good acid soil tolerance. Now, the ones with the exception are things like the bicerulas, the French cerradellas, and the yellow cerradellas, which are all quite tolerant of low pHs. But you've got to remember that that doesn't mean that they're not responsive to improvements in soil conditions. So in some of our um, earlier work, we even though the cerradellas were growing very well at low pHs down to 4.2, we were getting two to three um, ton increases in biomass production by bringing that pH up to around five. So even though they're tolerant, it doesn't mean that they're not responsive to improvements in soil conditions. So I guess generally in terms of pH, they work very well with the kind of soils that we come across in um, Southern Australia, where we've got a lot of acidic soils. So from a pH perspective, these, these legumes fit quite well. In terms of other soil characteristics, so all of these legumes will grow well on soils that have good drainage. So red brown earths and, and lighter kind of soils, they will all do quite well on those. They tend not to generally um, like growing in soils where you get long periods with poor drainage. The exception to that is gland clover. And um, one of the things I, I like to say about gland clover, it really is a plant with very few standards. So it'll take wet soil, light soil, heavy soil, and light soil. So it's a real all rounder. A lot of the current project that we're um, working on at the moment, which is a rural research and development for profit project, is focused on the less than 450 mil um, average annual rainfall uh, region. So we've been looking at how these things perform in those areas. And as you'd all know, it's not about just the annual rainfall that you get, it's the timing of rainfall and those sorts of things and how they respond to it. So through the drought, we were getting nice results with these where we, we were we're getting growing season rainfall of 70 to 90 mils. So arrow leaf clover, depending on the cultivar, can be variable. So there's some very late ones. Um, and generally, again, here, it's not just about the species, it's about the cultivar that you choose. So um, generally, they've done very well uh, in, in the target zone that we're looking at in the current project. And in previous projects, we've looked at higher rainfall areas where they've also done well. Okay, so in terms of the plant characteristics, um, the hard seed levels of these legumes is generally higher um, and quite a bit higher than what you're used to working with with subclovers. So that gives them good persistence in the seed bank. Rooting depth of most of them too is a lot deeper. So that gives them that kind of resilience um, when you have drought conditions or you have um, variable spring moisture conditions, but it also gives them that capacity to hang on well where you get false breaks that often knock off a lot of subclover and medic um, seedlings. In terms of the bicerulas and the cerradellas, the other interesting, interesting feature of those is their indeterminate growth pattern. So that means they'll continue to grow and set seed while ever there's moisture available. So they can be quite responsive um, to uh, variable spring moisture conditions in terms of their seed set. So if you have a dry start to spring, um, and then later rain, they'll respond to that, but they've also got the capacity to fix a lot of seed early in, in spring as well um, as a consequence of those deep root systems. Uh, the other thing um, here too, I just wanted to highlight with gland clover is it's resistant to red-legged earth mites, and that's a pretty handy little thing to have in the toolkit as well. And in terms of bloat risk, um, the cerradellas and the bicerula are quite low um, in terms of bloat risk. Uh, and so that's another attribute to think about in terms of selection as well. So getting on to how these things can help in terms of um, enhancing your farming system. So if we have a look at the traditional system um, and trying to get pastures into that, into that system, and we'll look at the bottom of the screen here. So your subclovers and your medics um, are quite susceptible to false breaks. So you generally have to wait until that false break period is over before you sow those legumes. 
And so that means you're looking at mid to late autumn and sometimes into winter for sowing of those. That means that they're coming up as temperatures are dropping um, and often it's quite late in the season, so the temperatures are quite low. And how much plant grows is a function of accumulation of heat units and that sort of thing. So you can end up with quite a, um, quite a short growing season for those first year pastures. And the other thing is your winter cropping program is starting you know, in, in sort of mid um, autumn and extending through into winter. So trying to get conventional pastures established, you're also competing with that winter cropping program in terms of resources on the farm. So if we have a look at what summer sowing can do, so you've harvested seed, you can use that seed off the header in its unprocessed form. So unscarified or in pod seed sown in mid to late summer with a robust inoculant that can survive um, the high summer uh, temperature conditions that you'll experience. The variations in temperature and sometimes in moisture can, can break down a proportion of that hard seed, which means that it's sitting there and it's ready to germinate. So often you'll get these little dribbly kind of rainfall events that are not a true opening autumn rain, and that would have stimulated a false break in a subclover or a medic. But these, some of these um, hard seeded legumes, because of their root system and their capacity, some of them to have better control of transpiration can survive that. So they'll start to grow on those small amounts of rain. And then when you get the opening season rain, they're really ready to start to, to really get into productive growth. So effectively, you have a much longer growing season um, through summer sowing with suitable species. So what does that look like? Um, so I've just chosen one of the sites uh, that's been established this year out at Condoblin. And what we've got up the side of those graphs on the vertical axis is the feed on offer at um, the end of May and at the end of August. So where we've got SS, that means summer sowing, NS is normal sowing, which is conventional sowing with scarified seed in late May. So the summer sows go in at the end of February, the conventional sowing is going in towards the end of May. So you can see there, even by the end of May, with the best of these species, um, the, the sown legume component, which is the blue in these graphs, you're looking at up to or between 1,000 and 1,500 kilos of dry matter per hectare. So that's starting to give you some coverage um, in terms of protection of your soil, but you're also developing a canopy um, that can intercept light and then continue to grow. Now I should say the other species at this site was mainly um, some volunteer medic, so some burr medic and some cut leaf medic. Now if we switch over and we have a look at where we are at the end of August, you can see there again with the best of these species, we're looking at five tonnes or better of herbage available. So that's a lot of herbage that can either be used, um, grazed uh, for livestock, um, and if we're talking about nitrogen, if you think that you've got 20 to 25 kilos of nitrogen per tonne of dry matter, you're already sitting on around 100 kilos of nitrogen under those legumes um, as a summer sow. And you can see that they're well ahead of their conventionally sown counterparts. So the growth rates from May to August, we're looking at more than 50 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day for the best performing treatments um, just for the sown legumes in, in those uh, in that trial, whereas the conventionally sown treatments, you're looking at less than two kilos of dry matter per hectare per day. I will say with this, with the Bicer ruler, we had two treatments there. So we had a, a straight unscarified sowing, um, and it'll become clearer why we put the other one in in a minute. But we also had a modified treatment there um, where we put 70% unscarified seed and 30% scarified seed. And that was on the basis of what we saw with hard seed breakdown in the drought, which was slower under those very dry conditions, specifically for Bicerula. We weren't completely confident that we weren't going to get another bad year this year, so we put that in as an extra treatment and it's worked very well. So if we have a look at what that actually looked like physically, um, in the top photo, you can see there that um, this is the yield at the end of August from 0.1 of a square metre for a range of summer sown species. Then at the end, you've got subclover um, as a comparison where it was conventionally sown. And all of those um, samples are lying on the subclover plot. If we have a look at it on a plot basis, what does that look like? On the bottom left, you've got the arrow leaf, which was summer sown on the left of that first picture. 
and then you've got its conventionally sown counterpart. This is on the 31st of August. And then we've got the gland on the right hand side and the same kind of comparison. So big differences in terms of biomass production just through changing sowing time and changing the form of the seed that you've used for sowing. Okay, so one of the questions that we often get asked is why don't you have subclovers and medics as part of summer sowing? One of those things, particularly for subclover, is around harvesting. So when you suction harvest subclover, you get a lot of scarification of the seed. So harvesting truly hard subclover, um, where the seed coat hasn't been compromised, is not really possible. The other thing you need to think about too is the susceptibility of those species to false breaks. So they're already susceptible. So why would you sow them in a condition where you're setting them up for failure? So rooting depth is one of the things that really, I guess, um, works against those species in this type of thing. They just don't get their roots down quickly enough. Uh, and there's also the practicalities of it. So to get an unscarified form of a medic, you have to go to header harvest where you're harvesting, you actually get in the head of the burr. Um, so there are ways where you can spread the burr, you can put it out through a super spreader and that sort of thing, but then you have localised competition within that burr because you've got more than one seed. So it's not that it's impossible um, with medics to consider summer sowing, um, but we've sort of taken the lower hanging fruit and went with the species that are easier to work with first. So understanding hard seed breakdown is really a key to getting summer sowing to work well. You've got to have the right hard seed breakdown pattern and you've got to have enough seed soften um, to be able to um, start to germinate early in the season and get up and go. So I've just put some examples in here. We won't go through them all, um, but there's just some variation in them. And there's some variation um, from Western Australia where this technique was um, pioneered to what we see in Eastern Australia. So if we start with advice to ruler, on the vertical axis, you've got the hard seed. So off the header, you're looking at around 90% hard seed when you sow that seed um, in mid to late February. By mid autumn, which is when you've started to have some of those little rainfall events, and hopefully if it's a good year, you've had an autumn break already, that's when you want some, hard, um, some, some seed to be softened that's able to germinate uh, and come up and commence growing. So if we have a look at the blue line, that's the typical breakdown pattern for Bicerula in Western Australia. So you're starting off at sowing with around 90%. By the time you get to mid-autumn, you're still in the high 80s. So it just doesn't soften quickly enough under Western Australian conditions um, to allow enough seed to be there to come up and germinate. Now, typically, the orange line is what we see in New South Wales. So we've started off around that 90%. By the time we get to mid autumn, we're down to about 70%. Now, bearing in mind with um, Bicerula, you've got about a million seeds per kilo. So, if you've broken down 30% of them, that's a lot of seed available for germination. And in summer sowing, you're sowing them around about 10 kilos of bare seed um, per hectare of unprocessed seed. Now, what we saw in the drought is the grey line with Bicerula. Um, so, we didn't get the hard seed breakdown that we would normally expect it behave much more like it did in Western Australia. So that's why we also put in a treatment this year where we looked at a modified um, a combination of scarified and unscarified seed for Bicerula. So if we look at some of the other species, you can see French Cerradella in both states has um, quite a nice breakdown pattern. So you've got quite a bit of seed available for germination and similarly with the bladder clover and the gland clover although it tends to happen more quickly in New South Wales, at least initially. And part of that we think is driven by differences in soil characteristics and also soil moisture levels. So coarser textured soils in WA, very little soil moisture through summer. So that seed breakdown is driven largely by fluctuations in temperature. Whereas in New South Wales, um, we have fluctuations in moisture as well as this in that hard seed breakdown. So you've got to choose right species and the right cultivar of the species for summer sowing. All right, so usually at this stage when we've put up one site one year to show how summer sowing is working, you get the yeah, but what about all of the other combinations of seasons and soil conditions and that kind of thing that you can get. So we've been working with summer sowing now since in New South Wales since about 2012 and WA was probably five years prior to that. If we have a look at 
New South Wales in summary um, over those years from 2012 to 2019. So I've left out the 2020 because they're still ongoing. So in that time, we've had 14 sites um, where we've looked at summer sowing compared, compared to conventional sowing. In these graphs up the side, you've got peak herbage availability, it should be units on that, that so should be kilograms of dry matter per hectare. Um, and let's just say, for example, um, we want to aim to have a minimum of 80 kilos of nitrogen available for our following crop and that type of thing. So let's set the benchmark at around about four tonnes of dry matter per hectare and see how we go in terms of capacity to reach or exceed those targets. So you can see on average there um, across all of the sites and all of the years with summer sowing, um, we've really reached those targets and often exceeded those with our summer sowing. With the conventional sowing, um, generally it's half or less of what we're seeing with um, summer sowing. So there's a significant penalty there in terms of how much herbage is produced. So in terms of reaching those targets, on average over the years we've, we've reached it or we've exceeded it. So what happens if we go to a drought year? So in 2019, we had three sites. Um, in those years, or in that year, across those sites sown into really dry soil, um, and those sites received between 70 and 100 mils of growing season rainfall. So you can see again there, in terms of peak herbage availability, um, generally with the summer sown, we were very near or over that target. Um, with them um, compared, compared again to the conventional sowing, which was again half or less generally of what we were seeing with the summer sowing. And you can see that those traditional species, the subclover and the medics, um, are well below that line. So simply changing the type of seed that you sow, the time you sow and that kind of thing can have some big benefits in terms of herbage availability, which is useful for livestock production, or for driving um, nitrogen accumulation for following crops. So wet year 2016, um, you can see here the differences in terms of tolerance to very wet conditions. Now in saying these are wet years, all of these sites were still soils that didn't tend to get waterlogged for long periods, but they were um, much wetter than, than they usually would be. So you can see the species like Bicerula and bladder clover suffered in those years in terms of herbage production. They, they just don't like being really wet. Um, but you can see all of the others. Um, again, summer sowing has reached or exceeded those targets. And the conventional sowing did quite well, unsurprisingly, in that year because it was plenty of moisture to keep that growth going through spring. Interestingly enough, the sub clover and the burmetic still didn't reach that target in those years. Now, if we just have a look at the averages, so arguably 2012 and 2014 were wetter than usual, but 2015, 2017 drier than usual. So on average, um, something more to near average years. And again, you can see summer sowing hitting and exceeding those targets. So overall, we're pretty confident with these that we're, we're reaching um, good levels of production and we can do it consistently, regardless of the type of year that we're seeing. So the other side of this is seed yield as well. Um, so the, the aim with these, along with providing feed for livestock and nitrogen for following crops, is to set up a big enough seed bank so that they can um, be persistent over time uh, and they've got capacity to crop over them without having to come back and re-sow because of the hard seed attributes. So with a subclover, you generally wouldn't want to have less than 150 kilos of seed per hectare formed in that in that year of sowing. So let's just set that as a benchmark and see how we go with these. So again, starting off on average over these 14 sites, you can see there with the summer sowing um, of the, the hard seeded species, um, we're always exceeding those targets on average over the years. Sometimes with the conventional sowing we're getting there, sometimes not, but you can see again that big discrepancy between, um, between the summer sowing and the conventional sowings in terms of seed production. So in a drought year, again, um, again, generally getting there with these species um, and summer sowing in a lot of cases has, has pushed you over that target. Um, but you can see the toughness of these things even under very trying, very dry conditions. In the wet years, um, you can see a couple of things coming to the fore there. So if you have a look at gland clover, I said it's a plant with very few standards. 
Um, it's done quite well in average years, dry years, and now in very wet years in terms of seed production. Our conventionally sown species have generally done better in the wet years. Um, interestingly, the wet year was the only year that subclover reached that kind of 150 kilo of seed per hectare threshold. Um, and interestingly enough, the bicerula and the bladder clover, even though their herbage production was greatly affected by the wet year, um, they were still able to produce uh, enough seed to have potential for strong regeneration. And then again, in our average year, you can see there, um, or, or in our average years, that they've done quite well. So again, hitting those kind of targets in terms of producing enough seed to set up robust seed banks. All right, so now you've got them and you've got a seed bank established, what do you do with them? So you've got to think about a few things here. So one is that the hard seed levels will be quite high in these. So you're looking by the time you get to the autumn following seed set, you're going to have somewhere between 40 to more than 70% of the seed in that seed bank that is hard. So you've got options. You could allow them to come back and regenerate. Um, now, how much of them comes back will depend on the hard seed breakdown conditions that you get and the species that you've chosen. The other thing is you can look at cropping them. So you can set up like an on-demand break in your cropping rotation um, because you've got that hard seed there. Now, the length of the cropping phase that you can run over them varies with the different species, how much seed you've set and how much of that seed is hard. So in deciding whether you go for regeneration or cropping, um, some of the things to consider are nitrogen. So nitrogen is very much a thing that you use it or you lose it. So if we think about 20 to 25 kilos of nitrogen fixed per tonne of dry matter under these things, based on the herbage production that we've seen, you're going to be looking at somewhere between 80 and 200 kilos of nitrogen um, per hectare that's present there. Now, if you let them go for regeneration, one thing is legumes won't always fix nitrogen. If there's a lot of nitrogen around, that's a feedback on them. They're like humans. If they can get something for free, they will. So is letting them go um, legume on legume the best idea? It might depend on what your feed requirements are and that kind of thing for that year. The other thing to think about too is if you let it go for regeneration, and we know that if you have a lot of nitrogen in the system, one of the first things that starts to come in is weeds. So you don't want to be wasting all of that nitrogen that you fixed on weeds. So cropping may be a really good option to utilise that nitrogen you fixed, reduce your um, nitrogen fertiliser bills and um, you know, start to get this kind of crop pasture rotation where you grow your nitrogen, you utilise your nitrogen going. Okay, so in terms of rotation, some of the work that we're looking at um, in our current trials is just this kind of thing. So the pictures here are from trials that were established in 2019, so in the drought, and the photos you can see there at the bottom um, were taken in July this year, so that's regeneration on them. Now, our original plan for this trial was to um, sow over the whole thing with wheat and have uh, different applications of nitrogen to see what the capacity of the legumes were to support cropping. But we had such good regeneration that we thought, okay, let's split the plots. Um, half of them will allow to go for regeneration and half will sow to wheat with our original plan for different rates of nitrogen. So they're ticking along now and coming up for harvest. Interestingly enough, even though our seed yields were higher in 2019 on our summer sows, the regeneration wasn't as good. And we took seed last year so we could have a look at hard seed levels. And where we had summer sown, um, the hard seed levels were much higher. And remember, it's cracking drought conditions. Um, so those summer sown species had actually had longer to grow. They were able to begin seed set earlier in the season. Um, they were able to complete hard seed um, coat formation whereas the um, ones sown later were trying to produce their seed and form a seed coat under very trying conditions. So you had lower amounts of seed on the conventionally sown side uh, and less of it was hard. So what are the implications of that for the ongoing rotation? That's part of what this experiment will be about. So we'll be looking at one-to-one -one rotations compared to two-to-one rotations. So that's ongoing. If we have a look at some of the results of that, so how well did they recover after drought? Um, and we're looking here again in um, May for a start on the top left. So we've got the amount of feed on offer. Um, 
And what we can see there with the best of those species, and I'm sorry I've switched to cultivars um, here, um, I can refine that uh, later on, um, but just look at the general concept for a start. So we can see that by the end of May, um, the best of those legumes were up around four tonnes of herbage already on offer. Um, by the time we get to mid-July, we're up over five tonnes in some of those cases. And in July, I thought there was so much feed on these, we're going to um, mow them and simulate a, a, a really intensive graze of them. Um, so we mowed them back um, to about two tonnes uh, and then looked at what kind of recovery we'd had by September. So the blue in these graphs is the sown legume and the other in this case was mainly ryegrass. So again, that's something you've got to think about in terms of your rotations. Um, we actually fallowed this on the 2nd of September after this was taken. Um, so, you know, essentially setting up that two to one rotation compared to the one year crop to one year pasture rotation. But you can see there that they're very capable of regenerating very well after um, a really strong drought. Interestingly enough, after mowing too, there's differences there in um, composition, so how well some regrew. So you can see there that um, the casbah, which is the viceroula, um, really bounced back strongly uh, and more so than what the um, Frano French Cerradella did. So one of the things to look at here too is again, this capacity to get up and away early, survive what may have been a false break and that sort of thing. So with our Bethaloo arrowleaf clover and casbah bicerula from mowing in mid-July until that very early September date, we're looking at 102 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day from the sown legume component of that sward, which is pretty high growth rates for mid to late winter. Um, and that's double what we were seeing with the sub clover. Um, at that site. So that uh, kind of work is ongoing um, and we'll see how that ends up. Now, one thing to be a hero with a bunch of white pegs, but the real world um, examples are far more interesting. So these are photos that were taken early in spring this year at um, some sites where we're working with um, different farmers. So up the top, the two top photos are at Beckham. You've got um, 2009 sown by Cerula there that's only allowed to set seed once every four years as part of the rotation that's imposed on it. Um, and then on the right hand side is a bladder gland clover arrow leaf mixture that was sown in 2014 and subject to the same type of rotation. So you can see that they've come through the drought really well. Um, down the bottom, you've got Ungari uh, and Talimba. Both of those sown uh, in the middle of the drought, and that's the kind of recovery that you're looking at this year. Um, so they've got the capacity to really survive and, and, and thrive, really. Uh, more examples here, this is at Parks. This is on a very light soil. It's a pH of about 4.7. Um, the 2016 um, established ones there were all used for seed production blocks. Um, they haven't had any extra seed added on to them. Um, so, you know, while they've set a lot of seed, a lot of that seed has been taken off, but they've still had the capacity to regenerate. And that 2020 established one um, is just another seed block that's up and away. Um, this particular producer is looking to uh, incorporate these with tropical grasses on a lot of this very light country. Um, and this is um, some examples from Turawina. So on the left, you've got um, Bicerula there growing in some very rocky country, setting a lot of seed um, and a combination of yellow and slender cerradella on the right, um, again, on some very light country. So um, yeah, they can be pretty productive in, in a lot of uh, different types of soils. Seed production blocks at Urim Quinty this year. Um, so you can see that they're ticking along really nicely. The crimson clover is actually not hard seeded, but God, it's pretty. Um, but it's again, it's one of those ones where this particular producer uses it in rotation as a one year um, kind of break crop. So harvests his own seed um, and, then, and then sows it across the farm. So in terms of livestock, the other side of things is how well do these things go in, in um, supporting livestock production? Um, so we've been doing some work around that um, over the years. So if we go back to our 2019 um, trials, the drought trials, we were also taking measures, and while we were doing herbage availability measures, we were also taking samples for feed quality. Um, and we've fed those into grass feed, 
for merino wieners to look at what kind of growth rates we could have got off those had we um, utilised all of, you know, utilised this pasture. So again, there you can see that difference between the summer sowing and the conventional sowing in a lot of cases. And this is, this is driven mainly by feed availability. So the qualities were not really that different, but it was the feed availability that was driving the differences in potential um, live weight gain on a per head basis. Now, if we start to work out with these, then what that may have mean, and, and there was a lot of pastures in the drought that experienced full utilization plus a bit, um, based on the amount of herbage that we had available, what kind of livestock production might you have got off that if you had exploited the whole lot? Now, not saying that would have been the right thing to do, but let's just have a look at it in theory. So the next slide will be based on um, what kind of production per head we've got, um, combined with how much herbage we had there to give us a figure of the potential production per hectare. So here we go. So this is where you really start to pull apart the, um, the advantage of summer sowing, even in those very dry years. So um, you had some quite high levels of uh, live weight gain per hectare um, that you were capable of where you'd summer sown compared to where um, there was conventional sowing. So another potential advantage of summer sowing and particularly in some of these really trying years. So again, the real world, let's have a look at that. So this is north of Condoblin. Um, this was a paddock that was sown in 2017 with Vice Ruler. The farmers come through, so it survived through the drought. Farmers come through in 2020 and over sown um, a light rate of oats into that. Now, he's also um, actually taken out the first germination when he's been preparing the paddock to sow the oats. Um, so what's come back is the, is the second germination of it. The picture on the left is um, five days after grazing. So it was an 85 hectare paddock. It carried 440 background heifers for six weeks in winter. Um, they were Wagyu Frisian crosses. Um, the minimum weight gain on those was three quarters of a kilo per head per day. So the total minimum gain per hectare was about 160 kilos. Based on the current market, if we conservatively, conservatively value that at three bucks a kilo, that's just just shy of $500 per hectare gross on that single six week grazing event. Um, and that paddock went for hay this spring. So the photo on the right is the recovery in that paddock five weeks after grazing. So it's um, been a really nice result. And he's a farmer who, um, you know, uh, started out with nursery paddocks to have a look at how these things would work in his area. Um, and the drought has really sorted out what's going to work for him. So some other useful bits in terms of these legumes. Um, one of the things too in, man in managing your weeds is you can exploit differences in grazing preference uh, and particularly for species like Bicerula. So this was some work that we did a few years ago, 2014 at Wagga, um, where we had uh, a Bicerula paddock and we were looking at changes in composition with grazing. So it's pretty strong Bicerula paddock the total dry matter over time is shown in the blue um, and the Bicerula contribution to that total dry matter is, is shown in the orange. So grazing was introduced in um, late September. So this was a first year established pasture. So we started to graze it in early September. It was about from memory around 15 DSE per hectare. So you can see over time there that the animals have been very effective in um, taking out the other component of what was in this pasture, and that was predominantly ryegrass. And so from setting that up for a following year cropping perspective, um, using, using the differences in palatability of these plants can just help, you know, I suppose complement herbicide usage and help extend the life of some of the herbicides that we have by using grazing to take out these problem weeds rather than just relying on herbicides. Another experiment there in 2015, this time at Tamora, where we were looking at similar um, things. So what kind of impact could grazing have on the amount of um, seed of ryegrass uh, that, was, that was present at the end of the season? So you can see we had um, seed head counts of 80 or more per square metre when we started grazing in the, in the first week. So this was, um, again, uh, a September graze on a first year pasture. Uh, the Bicerula is in the blue, it was a Bicerula subclover mix, the subclover is in the green um, and the bladder gland mix is in the red. 
you can see by the time we get to week three, we're getting very low levels of annual ryegrass seed heads um, present in that sward. So again, exploiting those differences in palatability to help control what might be a problem weed in your cropping program. Um, so I suppose another question that's often asked too is because these things are aerial seeding, people can be quite scared to graze them in the establishment year. And it's a valid concern. Um, the seeds are more, the seed heads are more exposed. Um, but particularly when you're talking about summer sowing, you've got such large bulks of feed on offer um, that there is capacity to utilise them. Now, how much you can utilise, um, that's the question that's, you know, that's kind of the burning question. It depends a bit on the growth pattern of the species. So those indeterminate species like the Bicerulas and the Cerradellas have capacity to recover from grazing and continue to grow and set seed for longer. It also depends on the seed size and the survival of the seed post ingestion. So things like Bicerula are very small seeded. So you're looking at a million seeds per kilo. Um, how much seed gets digested by the animals is really a function of seed size. So the smaller the seed, the more of it gets through the animal and survives at the other end. So this was some work done um, a few years ago. Again, I think this was 2015 um, at Wagga, where we looked at what impact um, the amount of residual herbage left behind in spring had on autumn seedling regeneration the following year. So um, the blue line and the, the, the blue line with the, tri the diamonds and the red line with the squares of Bicerula under two different grazing intensities. Um, and the green line, or oh, sorry, no, the, green, the green line with the triangles and the blue line with the squares of the Bicerulas under two different grazing intensities. And the other two lines are bladder clover and French cerradella. So if we look at a thousand kilos of residual spring dry matter per hectare, you wouldn't want to be grazing below that in terms of providing protection for the soil. You can see that the amount of seedlings that we were producing off the Bicerula um, in the following year was up over a thousand plants per square metre, whereas it was much lower for the bladder clover and the French cerradella. And a lot of that is a function of seed size. So French Cerradella um, pod segments, when they're ingested, a very high proportion of those get digested, so you don't get much coming out the back of the animals. And same with bladder clover, it's a much bigger seed than what you have for Bicerula. So um, that just gives you a bit of an indication of, of how these things may behave under um, different, or, or how these things behave um, when they're grazed in terms of impact on, on following year regeneration. So one of the things we're looking at this year in some of our work, given how much bulk we've had on um, the pastures, is what happens if we get a bit cheeky and we look at fodder conservation in that first year. So this again is the trials at Condoblin, um, and the top row of photos is um, the silage cut that we did in mid-September, um, and then we did a hay cut uh, on a third of the plot um, about three weeks later, and we've left a third of the plot uncut. So you can see that there was a high amount there and we cut it back fairly severely. Um, and down the bottom, we've got the regrowth on those sections. Um, so you can see the arrow leaf clover on the left-hand side, very good recovery in that in terms of um, the amount of seed heads that are there. Same with the Bicerula, the foreground is the silage cut Bicerula and the background um, is the uncut section that's now slumped. Um, uh, you know, it's it's getting towards the end of the growing cycle for it. Um, but you can see in the foreground, that indeterminate habit, again, it's kicked away. There's a lot of pods on there. Uh, and even with the gland clover, now gland's something you wouldn't use for photoconservation. It does have coumarins in it. So there's potential for dicoumarol to form if it does go through spoilage. But it's worth looking at it from the point of view of what if you did a hard graze on it. Um, and you can see there in the foreground, that's the silage cut. Um, plot recovered very well. There's um, a good number of seed heads on there uh, and doesn't really look that much different to the, un the uncut background. So with these, we'll be having a look at how much seed is formed, but also what proportion of that seed is hard under the different cutting regimes and whether that has an impact. And just for comparison, um, these are the plots of subclover and burmetic at Condoblin um, in the same trial. Now, at both silage and hay cutting time, these were below cutting height. Um, so 
they haven't produced a lot throughout the season um, and you also haven't had that opportunity to potentially use them for something else um, in that. And I should say, one of the things with the cutting um, programs that we've, why we've done that is also an attempt to manage um, nitrogen levels because in these drier climates, if you have huge amounts of nitrogen, then there is potential to generate large amounts of screenings the following year um, if you have very heavy crops and you run out of moisture. So some other work that's going on is some herbicide research. That's again, one of the more commonly asked questions. So we've got we've had some tolerance work in this year looking at above and below ground effects. So that's um, coming to a uh, conclusion now and we'll go again next year with that and have a look. So um, you can see there that's by Cerula with different herbicides um, and you know varying responses to application of those. So in terms of getting started with the legumes, coming back to that, clean paddocks are critically important. So summer sowing is a really good, very robust technique, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't cancel out the need to have good preparation in terms of weed control and also recognising what kind of herbicide residues that you have there. So getting started with hard seeded legumes, you can think about that in terms of how you bulk up a new wheat variety. Because you can harvest a seed on farm, you don't have to start with extremely large areas. You can start with seed nurseries and you can bulk up from there. So it's a real opportunity. What we've seen with farmers who start with seed nurseries is they often have something in mind with these hard seed legumes that they think will work for them. And I can say to them, what about you put in three or four of these other things and just have a look. The worst thing that can happen with starting that way is it confirms, um, it confirms what you thought uh, you should grow. Um, but the, another outcome out of it is it can open your eyes to other opportunities. And we've had a lot of cases where people have had something specific in their mind that they were going to start with. And after growing a number of these things and having a look at them in relatively small areas, so 10 to 20 hectares of each, um, just having those things in their environment, growing under their conditions, it's sort of shown that something else may work better than what they originally intended. And the beauty of it is you can put the header in and harvest seed and then away you go from there. Um, and so summer sowing, the other thing I um, need to say with that is don't forget about the inoculant. So you need to be delivering inoculant in a form that can survive those high summer temperatures. So I suppose the conclusions of this is um, we're now after quite a number of years, we're really satisfied with how well these hard seeded legumes are working um, in the soils and the kind of environmental conditions that we're seeing across central and southern New South Wales. And they've proved to be very robust across different soil types and across seasons. The beauty of it is the flexible options that you have um, gives you options for variable rotations um, for improving livestock production, for looking at fodder conservation and those sorts of things. The nurseries are just such a terrific tool for assessment of what you think um, might work well in your environment and as a way to bulk up seed and get you started on that program of um, you know, rapidly then increasing the amount of pasture that you can potentially have in your crop pasture rotation system with the beauty of being able to crop over those pastures without having to re-sow them later. So in conclusion, we reckon summer sowing looks pretty good. So we're nearly there. So just in terms of acknowledgements, I really have to acknowledge the West Australian group. So particularly John House and Ron Yates, Brad Nutt, um, Angelo Loy and Neil Ballard. Uh, they've supported so much of this work over the years with their advice and their enthusiasm. Um, and they were the people who developed these species and their symbionts in the first place and also were the pioneers of summer sowing. So we wouldn't have got anywhere without them. Um, and all the farmers who have given us access to their farms and watched us do crazy things in small plots and then taken it to the paddock and just done it so much better than what we ever could. Um, we're really indebted to them. So also our funders, so our current project is a rural research and development for profit project that's co-funded by GRDC, AWI and MLA. Um, and we're very grateful for that funding. MLA, um, AWI and GRDC have all funded past projects as well, either alone or in combination. Um, and that's the kind of thing that really keeps this going. And that national project um, now involves nodes in Western Australia with Murdoch and Deep Herd, um, in South Australia with Sardi, uh, and in New South Wales with DPI and the Graham Centre with CSIRO working across all of those regions. So 
anyway, that's about it for me. Um, I've talked for plenty long enough. Thanks, Belinda. And I hope you got a glass of water there to grab a breath. I was just going to ask, did you want to make any comments about the videos that we've started making of some of your fantastic growers? Oh, yeah. Thanks so, um, yes. So keep an eye out. There'll be more videos coming um, just in terms of farmer experience with growing these things. Um, we'll also have some specific videos out um, for seed harvesting and tips for harvesting your own seed um, with these legumes. So keep an eye out for those. Um, I guess, Luke, they'll be promoted through um, Twitter initially and then available on YouTube and, and those sorts of outlets after that. Yeah, fantastic, Linda. And having been out with you in the last couple of months to see some of these growers are seeing is believing after the unbelievably bad years we've just been through to, to see the growth of these things in the flesh is is just phenomenal. So it, it, yeah, really interesting and you've covered it so well. But all your experience just comes through and you're so clear on it all. So thank you so much, Linda. No um, worries, thanks, Luke. And, and yeah, and honestly, Luke, it's... um. You know, the farmers are the ones who are doing this so well. They they just do it so much better than what we do it in the small plots. It's um they've done a phenomenal job under some really trying conditions, particularly in the last few years. And yeah, they're reaping the benefits now, which is great to see. I think we'll call it a day. Thank you so much on behalf of everyone, Linda. And thank uh, you. look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you.